to Flora and Friends, your botanical cup of tea, a podcast for plant lovers of any kind. We welcome guests to our botanical tea break to explore the history, science and meaning of plants for our lives. My name is Judith lundbey felten I'm a plant scientist, university researcher and founder of Flora L Design and I'm the hostess of your botanical cup of tea. Hello to all listeners of the Flora and Friends podcast. It's wonderful that you are joining me here today for another episode on our forest series. And today my guests are all the way from Australia. I am delighted to meet Stephen Axford, who is a renowned fungal photographer and filmmaker who has contributed to BBC's Planet Earth 2, the Netflix movie Fantastic Fungi that you can watch now, his own Planet Fungi movie and numerous print magazines. And with him is Catherine Masiniak, who is a director, writer, editor and cinematographer who has worked with documentary filmmaking for a long time. And both Catherine and Stephen have fallen in love with each other about 10 years ago and also with fungi. And they brought them to us in the most stunning ways through their pictures and their time-lapse movies that have attracted the world's eyes to the wonderful world of fungi. And in this interview, I have asked them lots of different questions and there was so much material that I've decided to cut it into two episodes. So you're going to listen to the first part today and in two weeks I will release the second part. In this first episode, you will hear how Steve and Catherine discovered their passion for fungi, how they have developed ways to document fungal structures and the development of mushrooms, and how and why they have contributed to research. And in the next episode, we will then talk more about their filmmaking pro projects, the people that they have met in different parts of the world and also the process that it involves to make movies and the inspiration that they find for their different projects. I also want to invite you to really discover these wonderful pictures and movies that Stephen and Catherine have produced. And on our blog, I have linked lots of different resources uh, to their work. So if you head over to www.flora-l.com forward slash blog, you will find all resources there. And some of them I've also shared here in the show notes to this podcast. I hope you enjoy this episode and I say a very warm welcome to Stephen Axford and Catherine Machiniak. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I was wondering if you could tell me something more about you, how long you have been uh, doing photography of fungi. Well, I, I started actually as uh, studying a course in mineral technology in London. So it was more mining, geology, that sort of thing. I didn't complete the course because I'm not very good at studying, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so I drifted around for a while and then got into computers just at the start, and I found that I was really good at computers. So I, I stayed there and ended up managing the software group and um, looking after large computer systems and principal engineer I was called at one stage and managing the group at another stage and did very well at it, then retired when I was about 57, mm -hmm. I think because they paid too much. <laughs> I could afford to retire. <laughs> and I, I just took up, well, about that time um, my partner at that time died of breast cancer Mm. And I got a, a major disease and had to go through the recovery of that and was really 
really looking for something to do and I, I found that I really liked going out into the out into nature, what we call out in the bush in Australia, and just wandering around. And I, on impulse, I bought a digital camera in 2000, just a tiny little thing. I think it was oh, 1024 pixels by 768, the size of a, an old computer screen, tiny by modern standards. And I found I really liked this camera. I'd never, I'd had cameras before, but I was never any good at them. Film cameras were always a bit beyond me, you know, taking a picture and then waiting for days or weeks to get it developed wasn't my style, I don't think. So I started taking photographs and then I retired and I was taking more and more photographs and found fungi. Mm -hmm. So I started taking photographs of these beautiful little things that I found in the forest. And it gave me a really good excuse to stop and become absorbed in the forest and to start to understand what was going on. I also have a passion for being in nature and have been a keen walker since I was very young. And interestingly, when I go back and look at some of the photographs that I took when I was very young, there are mushrooms there. <laughs> and even when I was at art college, I did etching and I have a whole landscape that's based on mushrooms. It's bizarre. I think Steve and I were just destined to meet. And um, so, yeah, so, so we've combined our skills basically. You know, I'm the filmmaker in the team and Steve is the photographer in the team, although we both do a little bit of both so we cross over but um you know we just both have this passion for the natural world and for science and for fungi and and for communicating and so we've blended that all together yeah Stephen you mentioned that uh, photography hasn't been your biggest passion all through your life and Catherine has been probably having a different perspective on that so how have you been combining your skills there how much photography have you learned Steve through the years and what has Catherine brought into your common project with documenting fungi well I, I started photography about 2000 and it gradually built up and I bought better cameras progressively and um I met Catherine 2011, mm. where I was already taking photographs, but no one had really discovered me, if you, if you like. So I, I was just taking photographs and I was putting the pictures on the internet by this stage just because I, well, if you take photographs, you like people to see them. And I never had any thought that I might be able to sell them. So it was just put them on the internet at as high a resolution as I could and people gradually got to like them. And then Catherine came along and we combined filmmaking and still photography, I guess. So, yeah, so Steve and I, we collaborated before we were uh, a life you know, relationship, we, we collaborated on a little thing on time-lapse. Um, I was experimenting a little bit with time-lapse and said to Steve, why don't we go up and shoot a bit of time-lapse? There's a storm coming in on the mountains. And so we did that. We went up and it was amazing. You know, we were standing at the back of this enormous valley and mountain and this big thunderstorm came through and we had, we had very little equipment. We were just standing there pressing the shutter with our finger, <laughs> counting down for hours, four seconds, four seconds, <laughs> four seconds, and this storm came through and, and then this rainbow came out underneath us and it was just incredibly beautiful. And we also just loved being out in, the, in this forest in this one spot for hours and hours and watching the forest change. And we walked away from that going, oh, my God, time-lapse is really easy. <laughs> and we've never produced anything quite as dramatic as that since in terms of landscape time-lapse. 
But one of the things that happened was that Steve, and I'll let him take up on this story, he came home and said, hmm, there's this really interesting mushroom. I wonder how it would look in time lapse. We have these mushrooms here that are luminous mushrooms and they're a lot of luminous mushrooms are very dim where you have to go out in the forest and turn your torch off and wait for a minute or two and then this little glow comes out. These mushrooms, you turn your torch off and there they are. There's no doubting them. You could read a newspaper by them or I've even used a, had a stick with a whole lot on the end and found you, know, you can see the path in front of you from the light of the mushrooms. They're fabulous, which means you can take photographs of them relatively easily. And I took some setup. Oh, we've got a second shower, just a, a shower. And I blacked out the windows and set up a little dark room there for growing the uh, luminous mushrooms in and got these luminous pictures, which were fabulous. And gradually I built it up from there. Mm -hmm. I really like time lapse as well as, as some kind of like a way of capturing a process. I think when we go out into the forest, we only see um, a moment of time, a moment of mm -hmm. development, and we don't see the process. So in the time lapse images, you really see everything from the first the first parts of the fruiting body coming up to the degradation in the end after the process is finished. So uh, I think that gives such such a nice perspective on how fungi develop and which different steps there are involved in the development of the fungi. So I, I can watch these videos for hours and I'm always amazed how many different strategies fungi have found to grow and to develop. Not just that, you see all the insects that eat the fungi and spiders that live in the fungi and fungi gnats that spin their webs underneath the fungi and collect the spores to eat. Mm -hmm. yeah, and some fungi, as they grow, they spin. There's one that spins around in one direction, then runs out of, you know, can't spin anymore, so spins in the other direction, will even spin back in the first direction again. So why they do this, uh, the only theory I've heard is maybe something to do with air movement in spreading the spores. But really, I, I don't know. It's Mycena sect longicetae, a tiny little fungi with their hairy, they're, they've got these infertile cells off them. I, I call them um, hairy or spiky fungus, mm -hmm. but very, very small. Some of them only a millimeter across the cap. Okay. I wanted to get back to the time lapse uh, imaging, and I was wondering if you if you take them in and you grow them for the time lapse imaging, or if you set up your equipment out in the forest and you do the time lapse imaging there. No, it's all done in a, a studio. The studio, in this case, being a half shipping container which is down in uh, uh, my – I live in north, northeastern New South Wales in Australia and I have, we have about three hectares of land, so it's mainly rainforest-type environment and the shipping container is down by the creek. There's a creek running through the property with platypus living in the creek. and It's quite, quite exotic. Um, beautiful. Yeah, and very, very beautiful. But we can't – we've tried time-lapse in the forest with ectomycorrhizal fungi because we're, like you, we're very interested in this sort of fungi, but you have to take the studio to the fungus because the fungus doesn't grow properly without the tree. And transplanting a tree into a studio is not the easiest thing in the world. So we, we haven't really succeeded very much with ectomycorrhizal fungi. 
So most of the fungi we time lapse are uh, saprobes. So mm-hmm. we get yeah, bit, bits of dead wood and take it into our studio and watch the fungi grow from there. Well, in that studio, we have lots of logs in various stages. I mean, we call it a studio, but really <laughs> it's a very moist, muddy, rotting wood kind of environment. And there's lots of wood that we just keep in there because we see that there's mycelium and so we think, well, something might grow out of that. So then when it starts to bud, then we'll move it to in front of the cameras and start to time lapse it. And this last season, because of lockdown and um, and not being able to travel elsewhere and, and the dry season was quite dry, we ended up um, also doing some time lapses of cultivated mushrooms, which we create, which we then put into a much more natural environment and time lapse those as well. But all in our fungarium, we call it our shed, our shipping container. <laughs> yeah, wow, that's, uh, that, that must be a very interesting place because you need to uh, like accommodate both the technique in there but also the conditions that suit the mushroom. And how often does it happen that they don't make any fruiting bodies when you take in some dead wood? We've got a hit rate maybe of uh, one in two, one in three perhaps. So we're... I usually take in bits of wood that have um, mushrooms just starting, preferably in the, just in the button phase, and then I can watch them growing in, the, in our fungarium. And after they've grown, I usually keep the bits of wood to one side, and quite often there'll be more, another crop of mushrooms come out of the same piece of wood. So the the mushrooms, it's all very opportunistic, like certain weather conditions. It's not a climate-controlled shed or anything like this, nothing fancy. So whatever the conditions outside are, they're approximately the same in the shed. And certain conditions suit certain types of mushrooms. So we'll go through maybe several weeks or a month where it's, similar types of mushrooms coming up and then the temperature will get a bit hotter maybe or later in the year and then you'll get different sorts of mushrooms coming up. Mm-hmm. And the mushrooms, you know, the, you have to take a photograph maybe every at the fastest every three minutes and the slowest every half hour. Okay. And the mushrooms can take anything from... Oh, like some of the caprinus will be up and collapsed within the day. Well, some of the stinkhorns, they just come out in you know, a matter of hours and then start to collapse. But then other fungus, say some of the bracket fungus, will take a month or more, maybe six months, but I, I've never time-lapsed anything over six months. I've time-lapsed fungi over one month but that's probably about the longest. Okay. Yeah. That's fantastic. I've got a passion. I've got a passion for getting as many different varieties of fungus under time lapse as I can. I used to ignore things like xylaria and so on, but now I'll put the xylaria in front of the camera and see what the xylaria does because it seems to grow slowly, but, in reality, it'll have bursts of growth. So where, when it actually starts to grow, it can grow quite quickly, but then it hardens up and sits there for weeks or months before it may be another spurt of growth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's another aspect of it that you, you notice during the time-lapse imaging how slow or fast processes are and how dynamic they are. If they go on in a, like all the same speed, or if they have uh, waves of faster processes and slower, and maybe dormant phases where nothing happens, that's really an um, I think a, a knowledge that isn't available to just looking at what is out there when you don't record the process. So that's a, a, a great mm-hmm. contribution to knowing more about mushrooms. Mm, thank you. 
And, and it is one of the things that the mycologists that we collaborate with talk to us about because for them, one, there's so few of them in Australia anyway that getting out into the field is something that they only do once or twice a year. And then, as you said before, that when they're in the field, they're just seeing a moment in time and the time lapses have revealed so much more to them and um, and information that you can't get any other way other than, I mean, you can't sit in the forest and watch a mushroom grow. So even for us, I mean, it's absolutely magical. Steve will go down and collect the cards in the morning from the cameras, bring them up and, you know, process where the time lapses are at every morning, and it's like magic. <laughs> you get to see what the fungus has done in the last 24 hours, and, and often it's incredibly unpredictable. You know, even Xylaria, you know, Xylaria is a fungus that, you know, some people call them, um, some look like dead man's fingers. They're like black and or black and yellow striped and or, or very, very skinny little sticks sticking up, and you think, that they're not particularly interesting, but the time lapse that Steve's doing at the moment, you can see that they actually move quite a lot as they grow. They sway from side to side. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is that is true. Like uh, you, you see these movements that otherwise you wouldn't even notice uh, because uh, we don't. I don't think we connect much movement when we think about mushrooms. We just think they are stationary, <laughs> sessile, and don't move. Maybe grow, but that's it. But as you say, some sway and some spin, and that is a, a totally new um, observation, and also brings us to ask new questions. Why do they do that? And how do they like, mm -hmm. why do they grow slower and why do they grow more quickly at certain times? Is there more nutrients available? Do they undergo any kind of like a circadian rhythm or some kind of other uh, rhythm, which we don't know even yet. So that is a, a fantastic, fantastic processes that you have been revealing with the, with the time-lapse imaging. Maybe one question to to for me is I wonder how did you learn about fungi and how did you learn to identify them and how how comfortable do you feel today when you go out in the forest to know exactly what kind of fungi they are because I can honestly admit I know the fungi that I'm working with and uh, but I'm not so good in identifying fungi in the forest I know a few edible ones here and basically that's that's it and I find it challenging to remember all the names um, if I don't really interact with the material now you interact with the material much more because you observe them for such a long time as well but uh, I was wondering when it comes to the the naming and the taxonomy of the fungi how did you learn all that <laughs> well I suppose I've been doing it now for 15, 20 years. So as you say, you become the the ones you're working with and you see all the time, you gradually get to understand these unpronounceable Latin names. And I, I'm even becoming, uh, I wouldn't say good at Latin, but becoming passable at understanding how the structure of them is made up. But it, I'm not a I'm not a taxonomist, and I, I don't look at mushrooms in terms of uh, this has got this features and that feature, and therefore it must be a quaternarius or something like that. I, I just recognise the mushrooms that I know, and often they're identified by other people. I I'll, I'll put pictures of them on the internet, and people will identify them for me. So one of the big advantages of taking good photographs that people notice the photographs and mycologists will then come along and say, uh, this will be this. And I, I've generated some really good arguments over the, the years with people saying this is this and someone else saying, no, 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 it's not. And I'll let them argue it out and they come to agreement. They can tell me what it is then. <laughs> And we're, we're, we've also been really, really lucky because we've been invited to other places in the world to document fungi where we've had fantastic 
mycologists with us who are such good taxonomists and we've learned so much from them as well. So that's been a real bonus in our and, and a real growth in our knowledge is doing that. Mm-hmm. When, you, when you go out in Australia into the woods, do you look for something specific or do you look for anything that may be there? Look for anything that may be there. Not, you know, there's so many of the mushrooms here that we're not sure of what they are. That, you know, I, I've sent off some for um, DNA sequencing, and I think I, I sent off three or four together, one of which I was pretty certain what it was. Another one I thought, no idea, it must be a new species and the others were similar. And the answers I got back, the one that I thought was a new species turned out to be just a species already known. The one I thought was uh, definitely a particular species was nothing of the sort and was came back with a whole lot of question marks on it. So, you know, you can go out in the forest and you can think you know something Thing or the guidebook will, or the um, field guide will tell you that it is something, and it's not at all. Mm-hmm. That someone's just had a look at it and said, "Oh, that looks like that," and then afterwards everyone said it's this particular species, whereas really it's it's quite possibly not. <laughs> I think one of the things that we do when we go into the forest, besides just looking for what's what's there, I mean, documenting what's there, is it's the beauty and, and the science together that really inspire us. So if something's really beautiful, we'll just document it, even if Steve's documented it a million one times before. If it's a beautiful specimen, it ends up on, on the internet. <laughs> um, but it's also the science. I mean, you know, the more we learn, the more we just become obsessed with how fungi um, exist within an ecosystem and play such an important role. So often we'll document a specimen that has some element about it that speaks to those bigger themes of um, the role that fungi plays on the planet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you you say something very important that is uh, like the connection between science and how beautiful nature is. That is uh, amazing. And when you open the eyes for this aspect, how much beauty there is in science and in nature, you discover the world in a whole new way. And uh, as you say, I also like to take microscopy images of things that I have already looked at just because this is so beautiful. (laughs) I could just spend time uh, taking microscopy images of wood all the time again, because it's just a beautiful structure inside the trees. And um, yeah, this, um, I wanted to say something to the, the DNA sequencing. That's a fantastic tool that we have available today to actually know what there is. And last week I talked to a person who was uh, studying lichens, which are a symbiosis of, of algae and fungi. And basically the only way to know what really is there is to use DNA sequencing. But also the sequencing has its limits because if we have nothing to compare it to, you always need to kind of compare it to existing sequences. That can make it a, a bit hard when we discover new things to really know what they are. But the more we know, the more we can also place them in the context of other sequences and identify. And uh, that maybe brings me also to my, my next question. You have, uh, in, in addition to um, documenting uh, Uh, mushrooms for the general public in movies you have uh, helped the researchers and um, I was wondering when you started to work with researchers did that change your picture of how research works what a scientist is like and what did you think about scientists and science before starting to work with researchers well uh I come from a family which was full of scientists, and by I've got um, two brothers and one sister. My 
My eldest brother's a physicist. My sister's a physiologist. My other brother's a chemical engineer. I was the only one who didn't actually get a degree, but I started. My aunt was one of the first botanists in Australia, certainly the first um, prominent female botanist. So the, the whole family's been focused on science and, you know, I should have ended up as being an engineer or something like that and I just, I'm not very good at studying. So <laughs> I didn't do that. So I, I came to it all later in life that uh, I guess I've got more of a passion for communication. I was always quite good at science and I knew a lot of researchers. I had a lot of friends who were in science and science research. I've had a lot of partners who've been scientists as well. So it's, it's odd in a way that I, I'm not a, a researcher or a scientist. But it has been great, hasn't it, working with these young scientists? Oh, yeah. It's a terrific opportunity because, you know, we, we learn about mycology from contact with mycologists essentially. And they, they teach us a lot, but we don't have to go and do the exams. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, this, and this group that we're working with in Yunnan, they have young um, scientists from all over the world in that group. And the professor is from South Africa, um, one of our favourite local, um, you know, uh, per people that we work with in that group, researchers that we work in that group is Wei Li, who's from China and specialises in stinkhorns. And she's just, she's just a, a, an incredible knowledge bank on stinkhorns, but it's hilarious watching her walk through the forest carrying, uh, you know, phallic-looking <laughs> stinkhorn with a veil on it. <laughs> and... Um, um, uh, Samantha, Dr. Samantha uh, Charunarana <laughs> is from Sri Lanka and he's the most one of the most talented taxonomists we've ever worked with. And there's um, scientists there from Pakistan, from Nepal, from Myanmar. I mean, it really is a very exciting group. And so for us working with those researchers, some of them are working on very practical fungi stuff. Um, Phi is from Thailand and she works on the fungi that's involved in camellias and tea production. So it's very... Um, uh, driven by commercial markets. And then other people are working on really quite out there fungus, like one of the first um, cordyceps that's been documented on a mammal. You know, that's pretty interesting stuff, a little bit scary, a little bit science fiction, but uh, they found a cordyceps on a bat um, underground, which, you know, it's the first time that we've seen a cordyceps on a mammal. So... So, yeah, really interesting young scientists and they keep us young. I mean, that's the other thing is that working with younger people, they just keep our ideas and our view of the world um, continually refreshed. Hmm. Yeah, I was actually invited to go down in the cave to have a look at where the bats came from, but the, the, the 30 metre drop down this slippery rock, slope and I'm getting a little older now and I, I thought maybe not this time I'll let them go down and get the bats Bring for me bat. <laughs> yeah it sounds a bit scary to find something else in Asia on a bet we know what that has led to last time so <laughs> we don't want to have the fungal invasion as the next step I did make them all wear face masks <laughs> <laughs> that's good <laughs> <laughs> that is that that's actually the cordyceps fungi are very very special fungi because they they kill the organisms that they they grow in we we've discovered around here that there was someone the a local person who pointed out to us all of these micro cordyceps and just growing on the backs of leaves, you know, the tiny spiders and things that you get underneath leaves and the cordyceps growing on them. And there's lots and lots of them. We can go, go out into our garden 
just go down near the creek and lift up the leaves and you'll see these tiny spiders with cordyceps growing out of them or cordyceps-like fungus anyway. So we're talking, you know, insects that are probably two millimetres wide and then you see another cordyceps spike coming, uh, like a fruiting body from a cordyceps fungus coming up and it's about three millimetres. So they're really, really tiny. Mm. But what it made us think about was that, of course, there's this whole world of micro insects, right? And if they were out of control, how would the world look? And so there's this whole balancing act that's happening at a micro level between fungus and the insect world that we had never even thought about. And and that's what we love about this. It's like every time we have a conversation, every time we go out into the forest, we discover something new. And that's really exciting. Mm. Mm. How have you been, uh, now that you're working with um, documentary filmmaking, I'm wondering how much contact you have had with scientists and how easy it is to actually communicate with scientists when it is for uh, a film or any kind of documentation that is going to reach out to the public, to the general public, where there's non-specialists in the audience as well. Mm. So I cut my teeth in educational programming and worked within a filmmaking unit at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. So I guess I'm kind of, um, I love the challenge and I, my, I have a fair bit of experience in trying to get scientists to make this amazing amount of knowledge that they have, um, uh, what's the word, um, palatable or or communicable to the general public and and also I guess you know I I'm totally into what drives people what inspires people so that's the other space that I go to with scientists is to get them to communicate what it is that they love about their field of study what what ignites their passion about it. And so it, and, and I've done a lot of science programming in my career as a documentary filmmaker. So it is something that I love doing is trying to help people communicate what it is that they love about their field of study to other people. Mm. Yeah. It's one of the things that gives me, uh, you know, I, as I've said, I, I started taking pictures of fungus But when I started to realise that those pictures could be used by scientists to help them in communicating what they knew, it sort of opened up a whole new world for me that that really was something important, that in Nepal they, I took a lot of pictures there and a hundred of the best pictures they were going to make into, you know, A2 size posters or A size one size posters, one picture per poster, take them around to schools and get the the young kids enthusiastic about mushrooms and nature, and then take them to politicians and do the same thing. So it was used as an edu educational tool. And then in China that I was invited to give a talk, a Yishi talk, which is a bit similar to TED Talks. Now, I couldn't go over to China because of COVID. So I made a video or Catherine photographed or filmed me in the forest just talking about my experiences with fungi, how fungi changed my view of the world. And the person who was doing the editing in China was this woman who said she'd got interested in fungi and started studying fungi because of seeing my photographs. <laughs> I thought that's amazing. That's amazing. You know, the, the, you know, the effect of a photograph can have in a country that I probably knew very little about at the time. Mm -hmm. It's really as uh, you you notice 
that the, all the work that you have done that started from something that was beautiful and fun had a very deep purpose for yourself, but also it had a meaning for other people because you open other people's eyes for the nature and the values in nature and the beauty and why we need to protect these. So uh, that's um, a big contribution to the world, especially today where um, we need to be aware what is around us and make sure that we don't destroy it before we even have discovered it, what there is. Yeah. I think it's an example that, you know, um, one person who really inspires both of us is David Attenborough, and I think that that was where he started was he was in love with the natural world and he decided to show people the beauty of the natural world in the hope that they would fall in love with it and want to protect it. And I think that, that you know, we've learned from his example, his inspiration, and that is what really does inspire us as well, that if people, and, and certainly that example Steve gave about the children in Nepal is that, you know, they want those children to fall in love with the beauty of the forest so that they want to protect it. I hope you have enjoyed this episode. And if you did so, please share it. And if you're listening from a platform where you can leave a review or a ranking, I would be delighted to get a five-star review from you. This will help the podcast to be found and make even more people aware of how wonderful nature around us is. If you would like to be updated on future episodes, subscribe to us on YouTube, Apple, Spotify or Google Podcast or whatever your favorite podcast provider is. Or register for our newsletter at www.flora-l.com. I wish you a wonderful day or night wherever you are and I hope you tune back in here in two weeks for the second part of my interview with Stephen and Catherine. Thank you and goodbye.